Hi everyone, welcome back to the podcast. Today I'm joined by my guest Emma Bezik and we're talking all about genetics and epigenetics. So for those who don't know Emma, she is a nutritional therapist in the UK and founder of Life Code GX, the leading nutrigenomics testing analysis and training provider. She is passionate about the power of nutrigenomics to enable personalization of nutrition and lifestyle to empower individuals to optimize their health. Emma's focus is on identifying and understanding common genetic variants that can be adjusted, compensated, or exploited through diet and lifestyle. Although we can't change our genetic code, we can change our environment to benefit our physical, mental, and spiritual health. Emma is a member of the International Society of Nutrigenetics, Nutrigenomics, Institute of Functional Medicine, and a regular speaker, presenter, and participant at conferences on nutrition, genomics, genetics, and epigenetics. She is also the author and presenter of Life Code GX's popular Nutrigenomics in Practice training program. That was a lot of terms that some people may not be familiar with, Emma. Don't worry, we're going to get into all of those for those who are listening. Welcome to the podcast. Oh, thank you very much, Vivian. It's great to be here. Amazing. And yeah, to start off with, could you talk about your introduction into the world of genetics? Because it's quite a niche area to be in. I know there's like a million one different paths that people can go down when they qualify as a nutritionist so why did you choose this area? So we learned it at college so there was one lecture on nutrigenomics that I was really looking forward to even before it happened and as soon as we had it I was absolutely grabbed by it and I knew that was my thing Um, so I touched on genomics before as quite a young person so I had a really inspirational biology teacher who was really into genetics and we did all kinds of after school club fruit fly breeding to understand genetics then Um, and then at various points things kept coming back to me but kept reminding me and pointing me towards it And um, after my lecture, so I was studying nutrition, and after my lecture, I started then to do tests for myself and see what was out there. It was all a little bit unsatisfactory in terms of the usable information that I was getting and the advice that was available. And then I decided that I was going to set up Uh, a testing company for health professionals that was really high quality, really trustworthy and provided all that support and made sure that the information was really, really practical and usable. Um, For me, that's the whole point. You know, what is the point unless it's going to help you do something real, different, that makes a a change to your health in a positive way? Exactly. Um, yeah and then the kind of final kind of fate thing and I it's a big word is fate but I really think this was the case my very very good friend when I told her I wanted to do this she told me that her brother was a a geneticist oh, wow <laughs> <laughs> yeah and it was like how come I've known you for all these years and I didn't know that about your brother um but she then connected us and he gave us access to the right reliable resources and all those things. So it just felt as if it was meant to be, really. Um, and that's how it all started. Definitely. The universe bringing things together for a reason. I totally believe yeah, in that. Yeah, yeah, I do too. And to start off as like a basic, I want to do some like basic definitions here, just so we can get into like some more geeky, sciencey stuff. So let's start with the terms genetics versus epigenetics. So genetics is just about the genetic code, which is DNA, and that is fixed. So when you are conceived, your DNA code is fixed. So it's a combination of the code from each parent. And from that moment, when the egg and the sperm get together, that combination of code is your code. Um, And we're all unique in that code, um, apart from identical twins. So they have exactly the same code as each other, but everyone else is different in some way, or in lots of ways, actually. So 
we think um, that 99 point something percent of every human being alive today of their code it's the same so it's a small percentage difference but because there is so much of it so there are billions and billions of letters in this code so even though it's a small percentage difference the number of letters different between us can be quite a lot which is why we all look unique why we all look differently behave differently or different um so that's genetics and that's what we are testing when we do a genetic test we're taking dna we take it using a cheek swab so it's just cheek cells and we're reading those letters so we're we're basically decoding we're we're basically saying what letters are present for that person at these particular places on their whole genome and um, so that's genetics and genetics to a large extent, uh, determine how your biology works, but it's not the full story. So that's where epigenetics comes in. And epigenetics is the environmental interaction with your genetic code, and that alters how that, that code expresses. So what we mean by expression is um, skin colour. Um, so if you're white, you have genes that determine that your skin is white. If you're black, black, etc. Um, but the environment will sign, shine some light on our skin. It won't make a white person black, but it will alter the pigment and it will make us tanned. And that's an example of the environment interacting with our genetic code, our biology to alter something that is visible in that case. Um, and for me, that is the whole point, because everything that we look at, we want to understand how that is going to interact with environmental aspects. And um, because it's nutrigenomics, then our focus is food. But we also go outside that remit a little bit. And some other terms I'm guessing we're going to touch on would be homozygous versus heterozygous and also SNPs or SNPs. Yes, SNPs or SNPs. So that's quite a commonly used term now, and it is a useful term. What it means is single nucleotide polymorphism. So the single nucleotide bit is a single letter, and the polymorphism bit is multi kind of forms. So that's what polymorphism means. So we're looking at a single place on a gene and we're looking at the letters that are there. So you get one letter from each parent, one from mum, one from dad. And if it's wild type, that means there is no variance. It means the default reference letter is there twice. You've inherited that same one from each parent. If it's heterozygous, it means you've got one default and one alternative. If it's homozygous, it means you've got both the alternative letters. And those letters are A's, C's, T's and G's. So, for example, if your mum has an AA at one location, and um, say it's on a vitamin D receptor gene, they've got an AA, your dad's got an AA, and you're definitely going to inherit A from each parent and you'll have a AA. If that's the default, that's called wild. Um, but if your mum has an A and a C and your dad has an A and an A, then you will inherit the A from your dad, but you could inherit either the A or the C from your mum. And if you inherited the C, you would have one of each and that would be heterozygous. Um, and then homozygous, to, to get that at both alternatives, each of your parents would have to have at least one of those letter C's, the alternative possibility for you to possibly become homozygous or be homozygous. Um, so a SNP is literally looking at this place and it's looking at the combo of letters. 
um, and it's understanding what that means. So that's a big part of what we do, because in many ways, just doing the test and reading the code is like a commodity. Anyone can do it. It's pretty easy. Um, there are levels of quality and confidence in that data, but mostly that's a fairly straightforward thing to do. Um, but then it's interpreting it that is the important part. What does it mean? Are you interpreting it correctly? Or is someone just giving you a kind of over-egged explanation or a simplistic explanation uh, about that? So, so yeah, that's SNPs. And mostly we're interested in SNPs. So it's mostly these single letters that we're looking at, just really small changes. Occasionally we'll look bigger and there are one or two examples where we look at a bigger sequence of code and see whether that code is there or not. So you can have missing code or code that's inserted, um, but mostly it's the SNPs. Yeah, and your company, LifeCode, is if someone's ran something like a 23andMe, I think that's like the most common well-known one. Um, I started with something like that back when I was studying as well because it was pretty cheap and um, I just got back this whole page full of numbers and squiggles and I was like really confused and then I had I realized they then had to run it through a different software that just spat out a load of like supplements and no real um, it was just like you've got to live with this you have to take mega doses of this particular nutrient for the rest of your life and it, you could tell it was just a robot that had just <laughs> um, done that for myself and had no idea about my hormones or my health or anything like that so your panels that you offer through life code like tell me a little bit about the different panels um, I do want to focus more, mainly on the hormones and fertility yeah. side of things today but I know you offer some different ones too I personally ran the histamine one because that was something that I struggled with quite a lot and I find it very useful yeah, that's so um, we've got a, what I think of as being something for everyone, which is called Nutrient Core. And that looks at things like certain food intolerances, like lactose intolerance, which you would be amazed how many people are lactose intolerant genetically. Um, so that's the protein in milk. Um, if you're lactose intolerant, uh, a lot of people might not even realise so they're still drinking milk. And it's a genetic get... mutation to have, like, be able to tolerate it, isn't it? It is. Yeah. So that's an example of something that's a positive thing. So sometimes a SNP that is an alteration can give you, like, a superpower. Um, and that's what I mean by exploitation, really, because some people have natural beneficial SNPs. And I do think that is, you know, it's kind of worth knowing. It's like play to your strengths um, and support your weaknesses. Uh, but you kind of know, you know, where you, you're playing really in that case. So, so yeah. So, um, so the Nutrient Core looks at food intolerances like that. So lactose, gluten, also essential nutrients. So all the vitamins, they are essential for a reason because we can't make them and our genes actually influence how we process them so how we absorb through our gut how we maybe convert them into a more bio available or usable form um, and whether we then need or would benefit from particular kinds of a, a vitamin like you will have heard of methylfolate or folate or folic acid um, you know, so we can look at the genetics and we can see whether folic acid is a really bad idea for one person and whether there's a better form that's going to hit the spot more directly for them and be more beneficial. So the vitamins, some things around metabolics, so like insulin resistance, uh, appetite, for example, some things around inflammation and circadian rhythm which I think is fascinating to, um, you know, genuinely some people focus better at different times of the day. Um, and we've all got a slightly different circadian rhythm that isn't exactly 24 hours. Um, just like we've got hormonal rhythms, um, some of those are day, some of them are month, etc. Um, but they're all slightly different. 
Um, so that's nutrient core. And I think that's kind of a really, really great foundation that anyone would benefit from. And then we've got specialist panels, which depending on what you're trying to achieve um, in your health journey, you know, whether you're trying to fix something that really, really is out of balance or whether you're just curious or whether you want to really optimise something. Um, then we've got these specialist panels that include oestrogen balance, for example, and histamine detoxification and nervous system, which looks at the neurotransmitters like serotonin and GABA. Um, and there's little kind of overlaps between them because just like we're a whole system and a whole person, you can't just easily chop part of that out. But often people have an idea where they're looking in terms of something that they want to work on. Um, so like your specialism, the hormones, we'd look at oestrogen balance, which actually goes beyond just oestrogen. And histamine, because there are very significant interactions between histamine and oestrogen. So that may be relevant for some people who are trying to adjust their hormone levels and cycles and things. Um, and methylation, big word, methylation, um, is something that's also very closely linked in with hormone metabolism, hormone removal uh, or detoxification, whatever word you prefer to use for that. Um, but methylation is a, a process that helps deactivate hormones like oestrogen. Yeah. And that's another specialist panel. Um, but, you know, you can tell by the name of that that you want practitioner help, really. Um, just because the name the name itself makes you go, what? Um, what does that mean? Um, so we, we believe very strongly that people get so much more benefit from the tests by working with a practitioner like yourself, um, who's studied not only the nutrigenomics, but ideally nutrition as well. Um, so they know what it means when someone is lactose intolerant. Um, doesn't mean that it's an allergy, for example. Um, doesn't necessarily mean they can't have any dairy. Um, so for example, you could be lactose intolerant. That means if you drink, say, half a pint of milk, you're likely to get a kind of uh, windy, bubbly, digestive system, abdominal kind of bloating and things. Um, but you could probably get by eating a little bit of harder cheese. So with cheese, soft cheese is still very high in lactose, but hard, the harder the cheese, the lower the lactose content. And even if you're lactose intolerant, you could probably manage some of that and it wouldn't wouldn't cause that problem. You know, but unless you've done some nutrition training, then you'd probably just go, oh, I can't have any lactose. I can't enjoy anything that I love anymore. Um, and we're really about um, giving a real moderate response. It's not about taking things away from people. It's about understanding the subtleties of how to work with your genes. Yeah, and it's really empowering. And I'm my goal is to do all of the panels eventually and have all of this information about my body because I'm a geek like that. Um, but for some people, they could see this information as stressful or like anxiety provoking, especially if things like um, Alzheimer's risk or metabolic diseases um, and predisposition to things like type 2 diabetes might come up. So is that one of the common downsides that you see or that, are there any other potential downsides of genetic testing? I agree that is a potential downside. At the moment, we recently changed actually um, to only allowing people to buy our tests either through a practitioner or as part of a package that includes practitioner support for that reason. Um, there is nothing scary in any of our reports if you are working with a professional because that professional knows how to compensate for those genetic kind of weak points, if there are those weak points. The Alzheimer's one is a bit of a special case. 
it still falls into that category as far as we're concerned. Um, but it's in a separate report. So there is a gene called APOE that is the highest genetic risk factor for late onset Alzheimer's. And some genetic test companies just bundle that in with another test. Um, but we separate it out and we say, so you know that you're deliberately choosing this. That's why it's in that separate panel. Yeah, it's not like you're looking for your, your MTHFR and your hormones and then you see, oh my God, I have a high risk factor for Alzheimer's just randomly. Yeah, because yeah. it is one of the ones that in terms of the extent of the risk, it's a higher proportionate risk. So a lot of the genes that we look at uh, might actually be a very small difference. That's the amount, the magnitude, magnitude of effect um, might be quite small. Um, but then we we look at it collectively with other genes and then the lifestyle aspects alongside. Um, so some, some magnitudes of effects, the extent of the impact of a SNP might be quite small on its own and other things might be bigger and then the APOE is is probably edging towards the higher end in terms of just the risk of the gene variants. And how do we know if a gene is expressing or not or like is t another term is turned on or turned off so there's people who might get their genetics and they have the most like quote perfect genetics ever but they're still really sick and struggling yeah. and then there's other people with like terrible genetics but they're pretty healthy and functional. How do we know if they're turned on and turned off? So some are um, more determinate than others in that respect. So for example, with the lactose one, if you don't have the gene that makes lactose, then that's it, you just don't. Um, so that's very black and white, it's very on or off just with the gene. Um, but most things, it's a sliding scale. So I kind of do this quite a lot. Um, so rather than something being absolutely 100% off or on full volume, it's the genetic code might nudge you naturally down the scale, but then you can dial that scale up by putting the right environmental factors in. Um, or if it's over its best, you can do the opposite by pushing it down the scale. Um, in terms of telling how that gene is really expressing, it depends what it is. Mm -hmm. So some things you might be able to tell by symptoms. You know, it might be about how does the person feel? Is their mood better? Um, do they have eczema anymore? Um, things like that. It, so it might be something very visible. Um, something tangible or not so tangible. There are also um, sometimes functional tests that we might recommend to see um, what's actually happening at that point in time. So the genetic result is indicating the person's predisposition, um, but because they might already be experiencing certain environmental influences, then we, we might want to measure what is happening at that point in time. And we might want to measure if something's working. So, for example, vitamin D, there is a gene that, that codes for a protein that carries vitamin D around our bloodstream. Some people's carrier is less good at doing that job. And um, that would mean that they... <laughs> I'm one of them. <laughs> I am too. So it would mean that they have the same exposure to sunlight, they eat some food that has vitamin D in it, but they kind of lose that vitamin D. The carrier isn't so good and it lets a little bit of it fall by the wayside. And so it, if you measure that person's vitamin D compared to someone without that, that kind of detrimental gene then the the person with the SNP the less good carrier is likely to have a lower vitamin d level but you might want to measure it then take vitamin d supplements and then measure it again to check that your supplementation level is actually doing 
the trick. Um, but you know that if the reason for that being naturally low is genetic, then they're going to need that supplementation pretty continuously. Whereas if they didn't have that gene and the vitamin D was low, then it might be a case of topping it up and then it not taking so much effort to maintain that um, for that individual. And, and so it is a way of understanding where does my focus need to be or what am I get, gonna get the most benefit from doing in a continuous way. Yeah. Um, and that's the same for hormones. Um, so we can talk a little bit about hormones. Absolutely, on. definitely. And some of the most common ones, you've already mentioned the um, folate processing. So the first one I wanted to talk about was MTHFR. I, it was like a huge thing five plus years back and everyone was thinking it was the driver of all disease and everyone needs to take grams of folate and avoid folic acid like the plague. But then it's kind of calmed down and people realise like with all genetics, they're not set in stone and we can influence them in other ways. So do you think it is still important um, and particularly for fertility, like what's the connection? So I think it is important, but it absolutely can be compensated for quite easily, actually. So what this gene MTHFR does is it activates folate. So folate is vitamin B9, green leafy veg is the most uh, kind of uh, obvious source of folate food. Um, so you eat green leafy veg and it gets absorbed and then it goes through various transformational processes. Uh, ultimately, the MTHFR gene then gets involved and it performs a final step in activating that folate and making it into methyl folate um, and because there's that that only that one way to make methyl folate biologically it's quite a big dependency on that gene if you have a variance on that gene and it, it there's a particular one a particular snip so there are a more there's more than one snip on the gene um, but there's one that is quite impactful called C677T that's like the the way of referring to it and that can impact if you're homozygous up to it can mean up to 70 percent seven zero less efficient activation of folate and that sounds really big and it is big that's a really big effect for one SNP to have but listen to the term up to first of all that's the crucial thing it's like you know when you watch an advert for a sale and it says up to 50 percent <laughs> off it's like oh but you go there and there's only five percent off <laughs> and it's the same principle with this so you can have that snip and you can be homozygous and maybe in the worst case scenario if all the environmental factors are against you then it could be having uh, up to 70% detrimental effect um, but we can compensate for it three ways firstly we can make sure there's a good supply of folate uh, through food so that's first secondly there is another vitamin that stabilizes MTHFR it's almost as if it's got a chip missing from it you know it's like a pill a wooden stake that someone's hacked into and it's got a bit kind of weak and wobbly vitamin b2 actually it's almost like it plasters over that and it provides a stabilizing kind of uh, effect on that gene um, and so the other b vitamins are really really important for getting the most benefit from folate and that's why you often get them together as a complex in food or in supplements actually so that's number two and then the third one is you can go around it so you can just take methyl folate um, so you're kind of sidestepping or just going a different route to get there um, and the really interesting thing is that actually a lot of food already is in methyl folate form um, you know some of the supplement companies might not want that to be that well known um, but if you eat 
a variety of folate foods, nature packages that food in it. Sorry, there's a dog in the background. <laughs> That's okay. It's not mine. <laughs> um, nature does package that food in a very clever way, and it 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 provides all these complementary other B vitamins, and it provides the folate largely in that methylfolate form as well. Um, and then the other thing that is important when you're thinking about folate is B12. So the folate can't really go anywhere unless you've got B12 as well, because it interacts with the B12. Um, so that's really important. Uh, I would say think about the whole B family of vitamins, um, but absolutely 100% you can totally compensate for that SNP, even if it's homozygous, red on a report, you can just do the right things to support yourself. Yeah, um, and just because folate's good doesn't mean the more the better. The amount of fertility clients that I have coming in with like three different folate supplements is crazy. They're taking like a, one from the doctor, they're taking a prenatal with folic acid and then they're also doing an additional like high dose folate and it's just too much and they're anxious and they're wired because you can over methylate and that's just as problematic as under methylating so yeah definitely work with people uh, work with practitioner and don't just read something online and put it to practice in your own health you may yeah. be doing worse <laughs> that's such a good point it's such a good point and especially folic acid because folic acid actually uses uh, another gene, DHFR, it's called, um, but it needs a special action to get it through into your bloodstream. So that gene was designed to do a completely different job entirely. So it's having to use this same gene in another place. Um, so yeah, more, there's a limit and your body will kind of respond to very 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 high doses as you say sometimes in a really detrimental way and you end up doing more harm than good um, mm. there's probably people listening who don't know the genetics and are maybe wanting to try and conceive and i just tell most of my clients you might as well just go with the methylfolate because you're not sure if you're genetics because you might have this mthfr it's really common is it like 40 percent of the population yeah have this yeah yeah, it's okay. getting on to 50. It depends on what ethnic group, but it's very common. And that also says to me, whenever I look at a gene that is really common, how bad is it really? Mm -hmm. If it was that bad, it would not be passed down through to more generations and more generations. And there is research that actually says there are beneficial effects of having a slower NTHFR. Um, it depends what's going on around that gene, which is why we look at the pathways. So we have very visual representations of the genetic results that show what is happening around it. Um, so for some people, there might be other parts of their folate processing of the genes involved in that that are just really balancing out their MTHFR. Um, and a slow MTHFR can make sure that there is more folate available for cell renewal, which is important for pregnancy, um, red blood cell synthesis, white blood cells for immunity, and it can be quite protective and, and is associated with lower risks of certain cancers. So Very it's not necessarily bad. Yeah, it's not a, a clinical, I, I ask my clients diagnosis, some people put MTHFR as like a health issue. I'm like, this is very common. And you're, it's, it's not, not a death it's sentence. not a diagnosis. And it's <laughs> not, yeah, exactly, exactly. And I, once I, I heard an analogy, I don't know if it was through life code, but imagining genetics kind of all working together, like on um, a motorway, if one lane's blo um, broken or like closed down, there's all of the diversions and air roads that you can go down. So they, yeah. they compensate when there is slowing down of yeah. one area. Yeah. No, I mean, it's a very clever design that we all have. It's, it is amazing. Agreed. Um, Another SNP or mutation, if you will, that I want to discuss is one very close to my heart, the COMT or COMT. And with this one, in terms of benefits, it can make you very 
productive and motivated and once you're like on a task if it's something that you're enjoying then you can do it for 12 hours straight I totally feel that way but what about the negative side of this potentially because I think I've experienced those as well yeah so com compte or compt I would say this is as important if not more and useful to understand as MTHFR um, it's really really up there and um, what this does is it deactivates estrogens by methylating them so it adds this methyl group which is just a carbon and free hydrogens but it's just transforming that estrogen into an inactive form of estrogen it also inactivates neurotransmitters and the excitatory neurotransmitters which are dopamine noradrenaline and adrenaline so that same gene it's almost as if it's got these two really important jobs to do but they're quite different um so if you have a slow compt which is if you have the variances the alternate letters then um, that can mean that your natural ability to deactivate hormones is slower it's almost as if the pipe that those hormones need to go through is narrower. So there's just less capacity. And um, it's the same for the dopamine and the adrenaline. And so imagine if you've got a lot of dopamine or a lot of adrenaline going on because you've been quite stressed and you've got high estrogen and they're both competing for that same outlet pipe. Um, or same lane of the motorway. Um, I like that analogy, it's great. So then that means they can't all get through, you know, if there's too much of them. So they're going to stay around for longer, they're going to stay in your system for longer. Um, that may be a good thing, it may not be a good thing. So it might be a good thing from a dopamine perspective if you really want to focus, and that was your point. So you need you need dopamine and noradrenaline to focus and get that job done and not be too distracted. Um, so that's a really positive side. And you might also find that your focus or ability to focus alters with your menstrual cycle because of this interaction between the estrogen and the dopamine. So you might not have particularly high dopamine um, but when your oestrogen is higher, that can actually block the pipe and stop the dopamine kind of escaping down it too quickly and give you that focus. Alternatively, if everything is high anyway and you're super stressed and wired, then actually when your oestrogen is high in your cycle, that can feel as if it's really pushing you over the top and you just might feel like shouting at, you know, you husband or your friend or your dog or your kids or whoever just happens to be there um, just because that's that's what's happening um, and if you have a fast comp which is the opposite then actually this might drain all these things really quickly um, that might not, again not necessarily bad or good per se depends on the context it depends how much estrogen how much dopamine, how much stress is going on um, for that person. Um, so I have a fast comp, which means I should be able to drain all this stuff really quickly and I shouldn't have high estrogen, for example. But I've done functional tests that have shown high estrogen and I've had symptoms of high estrogen and I know it's because I've had long periods of stress. So yeah nothing is inherently with comp especially not inherently good or bad it but it helps you to understand yourself exactly it gives me a reason to be um angry and frustrated at times I blame yeah. it on my genes <laughs> yeah absolutely or you might think oh I recognize that and I I you know I don't want to shout at my my three-year-old again <laughs> um poor kid um so you can then work on the nutrition you could work on estrogen detoxification 
You could work on supporting your COMPT gene specifically if you want to, and that involves the B vitamins, so it's methylation, B vitamins, including the folate, but the whole complex, but also magnesium can be really helpful in, in kind of freeing up that pipe, really. Um, think of it that way. You're just kind of smoothing the way a little bit um, and helping helping that to work better. Great. Uh, another one are the sulfation genes. So this is like another key. It gets quite overlooked. I think everyone is so focused on methylation as like the biggest liver detox pathway. But I had like quite a few issues with sulf sulfation. Um, so I've been like really diving into the research and found that there was a really big hormone connection with SNPs like, is it SULT or S-U-L-T? Could you yeah. talk about that one? Yeah, so there's a family of SULT genes um, and often actually the name of the gene reflects what it does. So these are all sulfonation genes and, and some people call it sulfation, some people call it sulfonation, but the key is that they need sulfur to to work so the proteins that are made by the genes or coded for so the genes the genetic code is actually like an instruction to the body to make these these proteins these enzymes and they are made from sulfur so that's hence the name and so you need sulfur foods to support those enzymes to do that job and it's like a it's like a phase two of detoxification so the compt comes first and then it's the sulfonation so the compt is deactivating the estrogen and the sulfonation is basically gluing the estrogen to a sulfur molecule and then that allows it to stick to it and be removed from from your body um, so you need sulfur foods so that's things like uh, cruciferous veg which everyone talks about broccoli a lot don't they um, when we're talking about estrogen but cruciferous veg um, leeks onions garlic those sorts of foods are really really supportive of that pathway um, really really important so there you go that's that's the real kind of thing that you can do to help your salt genes even if they're red mm -hmm. so and because there's a family of them so I think there are two or three that we report on the estrogen panel um it's unusual to have everything red on there um but you kind of get a good idea as to it's almost like you've got a family and there's maybe one of them that isn't pulling their weight or you know maybe the whole family are a bit rubbish at a certain thing yeah and that's why i think it is useful to look at genes collectively as well and not just focus in on one single one often it's like where does this sit in the context you know genes don't just happen on their own they've got a context so i almost when i get a report i almost kind of blur it out it's almost just how much how much alteration is there for that person on their whole estrogen life cycle? Does it look very red or is it mostly green with a little bit here and there that we need to kind of zone in on? Exactly. There's always going to be like a few mutations for everyone. So even though they're called mutations, people think they're like really bad, but we have to keep emphasizing how common these things are. Yeah. You know, just looking at, um, a previous episode I did on sulfur it was with Dr Greg Nye and if there's anyone listening who thinks like I can't tolerate those foods they make me feel sick I get skin rashes and headaches after eating things like garlic and onions you could have issues with processing sulfur so we talk about that in episode 51 if you want to go back I'll link that in the show notes and an interesting one that I wanted to talk about and I don't hear much about this um, kind of collection of SNPs would be the CYP SNPs and how they can affect things like um, estrogen and they can upregulate the harmful types and they can increase androgen levels and potentially exacerbate things like PCOS. I don't think people really discuss this much, but can you can you share a little bit of information? Yeah, yeah, I think they're so important. 
as well. So CYP 450s are a family of, of genes that are involved in phase one detoxification. But in some ways, that's a little bit of a misnomer, because if you think about how oestrogen is made or its whole life cycle, the CYPs occur quite early on. So they're actually converting androgens to oestrogens and they're converting oestrogens to different sorts of oestrogen. So a big process is called hydroxylation, which sounds like a big word, but basically that's creating a, a set of different hydroxy oestrogens that have quite different effects in the body. So um, there's a 2-hydroxy, which is generally thought of as being the nice, helpful, good, beneficial one. Um, and then there's a 16, which isn't that helpful, and a 4-hydroxy, which also isn't that helpful. So you will have all of these, but you want to ideally have them in a certain ratio, with the 2-hydroxy being the dominant one. And some people have a SNP on a gene called CYP1B1, which means that that gene works a little bit more quickly. So mostly when we talk about SNPs, the SNP has an effect, which means that that gene is slower. But for the CYPs, it's the opposite. They can work more quickly. And the potential of that particular SNP is that it makes more of the 4-hydroxy estrogen. And that 4-hydroxy estrogen can create or, or be involved in the generation of semiquinones, free radicals, and then it, it's got associations with cancer and DNA damage and things like that. So we, we don't want more of it than we should have, basically. So if you have a SNP on the CYP1B1, that can indicate that that's maybe slightly more active. Um, you can encourage the 2-hydroxy with berries. Um, so berries have got elagic acid in them, but it's just any red, black berries, blue uh, berries will have this in there. And broccoli um, can also help the 2-hydroxy pathway as well, so cruciferous veg. Um, but you don't want too much of that. I mean, you, you'd, you'd struggle probably to have too much actual broccoli, to be honest. You'd have to eat mountains of it. Um, and yeah, I think food is safe. Um, but sulforaphane, which is another long word, but that is a component of broccoli and broccoli sprouts. Um, sulforaphane actually helps the products of the 4-hydroxy, like the semiquinones, reverse. So it switches them back. It's kind of pushing the arrow back the other way, sending them back and saying, can you do something different with this, please? Stop making all the kind of collateral kind of rubbish. I'm sending it back where it came from. So, so there is so much you can do with diet. Um, around that part of the hormone process um, and if you really feel that you've got too much for hydroxy and that CYP1B gene is too fast then you can you can look at it preventatively which is the slowing down you can look at it also from a so what are the potential consequences and how do I guard against them so if there are likely to be, there's too much of it, more risk of these free radicals, then you can deactivate those free radicals and neutralize them with glutathione, the master antioxidant. So think about antioxidant support as well. Um, and glutathione is made from sulfur. So it kind of comes full circle. I think with the hormone balance, there are some nutrients that are like the major master nutrients that really really make a difference with these different pathways um what would they be like you've mentioned b vitamins ideally methylated magnesium yeah um brassicas. sulfur yeah sulfur yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. brassicas indole free carbonyl which is in sulf 
for refined foods, brassicas, a lot of bitters as well. So bitter foods um, and I mean, definitely green veg. For me, it really, when I go to the supermarket now, I I kind of, it, it's almost like, I don't think why am I buying it because that is now automated. It's kind of like, it's just, you know, that it's it makes you feel better. Um, and if the food isn't enough, then there are supplementary options. Um, and your practitioner can make sure that you're buying the ones that are going to make the best difference to you. Um, you know, so I recently started taking a cysteine complex um, and I'm still cycling and I still have surges of oestrogen and I could at times sometimes feel a surge of oestrogen. Um, and I started taking the cysteine complex and I know just because I'm quite intuitive in terms of my kind of sense of my hormone levels, I know that that's had a really beneficial effect on my detoxification pathways. Um, and mine isn't comped actually, mine is more, mine is more the sulfur <laughs> as mm -hmm. well. Yeah, but there's been times that like I do very well with sulfur and support in that area, but there was a time um, a few years back where I couldn't tolerate anything like that and it would actually detox me too quick. It was pushing pathways too fast. So again, just yeah. because something's, good for one person with the same snip um it may not be right for you so everyone is completely different and i agree with the food first food is medicine and um, because once you add in the supplements they're like mega doses of the same compounds so they can really make big changes and then you mentioned the other one that i'm guessing it speeds up the conversion of androgens to estrogen so does that end up with maybe low testosterone and estrogen dominant type picture yeah, so CYP19A1, um, this is this converts the androgens exactly to the estrogens, and it's more and more important when you get to an age where you're more dependent also on um, adrenal hormone kind of synthesis and that part of the system doing its bit. So like perimenopause, um, menopause. Yeah, time. yeah, exactly. Um, but if you are stressed, stress upregulates that process. So you can have this flow, this conversion from androgens to estrogens working far too quickly. If you are zinc deficient, that can also tip the balance really, really out. Um, so, you know, zinc deficiency is really common or insufficiency. And there might not be any obvious symptoms to most people that they've got low zinc. Um, but if you've been in fighting infection, for example, then that's likely to have depleted your zinc levels. So, you know, you might just think, oh, I'm just recovering from that. You don't think about needing extra, but then it's gonna, it's having all kinds of impacts on your hormone balance. Um, you might think, what's going on? I was all right. And, you know, I got that illness and that seems to have had all these other detrimental effects on all kinds of other systems. Um, so, and you can look at the genetics and see whether you've got a more of a predisposition anyway for that to work more quickly or more slowly. Um, stress, I mean, as you know, stress and hormones sex steroid hormones are also interwoven um, because cortisol is made from cholesterol, progesterone, estrogen, testosterone, all made from cholesterol. So if you're fighting or your system is trying to decide what the priority is, then there is all kind of pulls and pushes on that, um, on that process and on that same starting substance. So huge, huge interactions between that, that aspect and your sex steroid hormones. And if you look at the genetics, you can see whether that is more or less likely to be an issue for any particular person. Yeah, because stress affects everyone negatively um, over time. But for some people like myself, I'm very stress sensitive and I need to manage things and balance things as much as I can otherwise my hormones are the first thing to go which is kind of a blessing because it teaches me like nips in the bud as quickly as possible and I'm not left 
over decades kind of fighting this issue. Are there any other SNPs or points that you want to make on genetics before we finish up? I've got a few questions that I always end on, but I just want to make sure that we've covered everything. And I'm also personally interested in what you think the future of genetics hold. So I think we've covered a really good range of genes and SNPs. I mean, we could talk forever. I, <laughs> I could just let me and I'll talk forever. <laughs> Um, but I think that's been a really good selection um, as well. And especially for your audience, I think we've done a really good overview of a lot of the the kind of hormone related pathways. So I've really enjoyed it. Actually. Good. Yeah. Amazing. And yeah. my final few questions are for you personally. So the first one is what's one food or supplement that you couldn't live without? So mine, this is really weird um cheese <laughs> as a nutritionist so many nutritionists would be horrified by that but it's and I know why it is now it's because I have a fast comp I have a tendency to low dopamine mm -hmm. and what how that manifests itself is I'll open 10 or even 100 tabs at once on my computer it's just it's almost like I can't concentrate on one thing I've got to have more and more and more things or I can't force myself to actually do something until the very last minute um so cheese actually include it uh, contains tyrosine or tyramine tyramine the amino acid and that is a precursor for dopamine and all my life I've loved cheese and it's my comfort so if I'm ever really really stressed um or disturbed by something I just want cheese <laughs> that's a perfect example of how we're opposite because I have the slow com tea so when I have cheese I get migraines yeah because my neurotransmitters are yeah. too high the histamine levels are too high I can't process it so I wouldn't be able to focus at all but for like the my brain is like inflamed <laughs> Yeah, so isn't that interesting? Yeah. Same food, completely mm -hmm. different effects on the two of us. And um, we didn't even prepare that. It I was know. Just <laughs> very, yeah, very good point. I'm glad that that came up. What's one thing that you do daily to stay in hormonal harmony? Um, so I don't do it every day, but I think one big thing for me is exercise actually um you know i'm a nutritionist i believe in nutrition and there's lots of nutrition things i could say um but if i don't exercise regularly and i just think gosh it's three days since i really got my heart rate up and got a bit of a sweat on then i feel as if i i'm just starting to kind of clog up a bit for want of a better turn um so you know it's it i think it detox is also about sweating um, and that aspect as well I think the other thing for me that is a nutritional habit is berries um, so I actually have blueberries and raspberries and sometimes I mix it up a bit but I, I have that uh, every other day um, as a breakfast food and I just think it works for me. It's really easy. Mm -hmm. I love the taste. I'll put some seeds on top sometimes, a bit of nuts and seeds, sprinkle it, um, and maybe a little bit of creme fraiche. So is there a book that you can recommend on the subject of genetics or epigenetics? So it depends where you're at in terms of your level of kind of detail, really. I love a book called Gene Eating by Giles Yeo. Um, so he's a British, I think he's a geneticist, like a Cambridge guy. Um, but that book is such a fun read. It's really, it's accessible, but it's it's competent and it's accurate. Um, and he just makes it all really relatable. Um, so he's Chinese and he talks about his alcohol flush, which is genetic and how his dad can't even take a sniff of champagne um, and and things like that. And he's, yeah, gene eating, Giles Yeo, is a really, really good starter for anyone. I've read it like 20 times. It's like my bath time, easy read now. I've never heard of that, but I, I know the guy, he's on like a few of the health, like the yeah, ITV yeah. or BBC programs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And then there's a, a almost opposite end of the spectrum, a book called Nutrigenetics by someone called Martin Kohler, um, spelt with a K. And if you are wanting to get really quite deep into nutrigenetics, nutrigenomics, I'd recommend that. Um, so it's a lot more technical, but again, it's almost like everything you could ever want to know about. So when I start researching something that I don't really know much about yet, and it's about nutrigenomics, I'll just go there first. Um, so yeah, there aren't that many books actually out there on the topic. Um, One of my favourites, have you read The Dirty Genes by Ben Lynch? Yeah, so that's what your quite that on? good. That's quite a good, uh, I would say, start starter for everyone. Um, that covers a lot of things. And again, it's quite accessible and relatable, isn't it? So Yeah, it's so got yeah. some quizzes in there that even if you don't do the gene testing, it could just be a good intro. So yeah, yeah I really like that one. Yeah. And then last question is, where can people find more from you online and also um, the products and services from LifeCode? So we've got a website, um, lifecodegx.com. And on that website, there are links to various other resources. So you can see examples of our reports. You can link through to our Crowdcast channel, or you can go to Crowdcast slash LifeCodeGX. And on there, there are lots of what we call snapshot videos that are short videos about particular topics. Like we've got one on estrogen, we've got histamine, we've got one on intermittent fasting, just a whole variety of topics that are meant to be just quite short, accessible things, as well as uh, more formal training for practitioners on there. Um, and yeah, social media, Instagram. Um, we yeah like putting little, again, little snapshot explanations of particular genes or topics on there. So all the usual social media platforms, really. All those will be linked in the show notes as well. But thank you so much, Emma. This has been amazing. Got to geek out a little bit for myself, which is always fun. And it was good to connect with you again.